Twitter. It's Gary Parish. Welcome to the Ion College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. Matt Norlander is here with me. We're live in Phoenix. We're roughly 52 hours away from the national semifinals. We're going to get it on Saturday. NC State, Purdue, followed by Alabama and UConn. And Norlander, would you believe it? We already have controversy, and that's because the reigning national champions didn't get here until the middle of the night. You spent all night last night discussing it, reporting on it. Yes. What's the latest with the UConn situation? I'm going to get to the latest in just a second. But we are live on television, and there is some sort of <laughs> there is some sort of sound check happening behind us as we go. So if you hear any of that, we can't control. We're coming to you from the Phoenix Convention Center, downtown Phoenix. Obviously, GP and I will be on site at State Farm Stadium, and we're going to have the podcast again, CBS Sports Network, on Friday from State Farm Stadium. All right, so here's the deal. Here's the deal with UConn. We have had a travel nightmare situation. I think GP's actually had a couple of them. I'll ask him that in a second. But I get a text from Dan Hurley. So I, I land in I land in Arizona, and uh, he's, he's our national coach of the year, by the way, at CBS Sports. But we'll talk about that more on tomorrow's show. And he says, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, we are still waiting on a plane. We're not, we're not able to fly out. I was like, what do you mean you're not able to fly out? Because the NCAA, uh, it, it controls all travel for men's and women's teams. Um, long story short, the plane they were supposed to have coming out had mechanical issues. They got delayed 20 minutes. Then they were told it was 40 minutes, and then it was an hour. And so when they thought they'd be leaving around 4.30 Eastern on Wednesday to go to Bradley Airport in Connecticut, things got pushed and pushed and pushed. Eventually, the players just went back and hung in their dorm rooms and, were, and their living spaces. They got to the airport late Wednesday night. They thought they'd be able to leave at 1130 on a smaller plane, a different plane. That plane had paperwork and mechanical issues they had to work through. There was still a huge storm in Connecticut. In one of the weirder reporting moments of my career, and I'm three hours behind, obviously, in Arizona, I got texts from multiple people on the plane. As it's literally speeding down the runway, getting ready to take off, it did indeed take off uh, at 1.33 in the morning East Coast time. They landed after 3 a.m. Pacific time, body clock for UConn. Oh, after 6 a.m. So they might they might all be sleeping right now. They we, they might be sleeping. I have no update from you from Dan Hurley right now because he might be passed down. And if he's not, I guarantee you he's probably the only one with UConn's program that's not. But uh, it became the first story. Is it the worst thing in the world? No, it's not. But you know Dan Hurley. Everyone else is already here. They, everyone got here before UConn. you got to fly across the country. It can induce Every, we, we know travel stresses, travel anxieties. Imagine that before, you know, the biggest game of your season getting pushed back a good 13, 14 hours. So is this just something that happened because sometimes unfortunate things happen? Or is there somebody to blame? I'd like to blame somebody when things go wrong. I like to point fingers. Is there somebody we can point a finger at? Well, I, I, I don't. I, listen, I, I, Dan Hurley has, has, has to have sent a bogey to someone. Because <laughs> if... After UConn is just killing, eviscerating, vaporizing teams, everyone's picking them to win the title. Everyone's now behind UConn entirely. Dan Hurley had nothing to point to to say, here's why we've been shortchanged. Here's who's overlooking us. He can now say they're doing anything possible to prevent us from winning this national championship. I don't know who's at fault, but uh, a, a, a confluence of factors led to UConn getting a late arrival. Oh, by the way, here on the ground, Dan Hurley will have his regularly scheduled press conference. It'll be 320 local, 620 Eastern. But everything else with UConn's team, they're going to go through practice, but they're not going to do their media obligations. So that's all getting pushed back to Friday. And, frankly, that's obviously uh, the wise move uh, after getting in so late. Just so we're clear, we don't believe anybody intentionally no, is trying to I, that's derail what I'm saying. I don't UConn know what you're going to say on national this. championship <laughs> okay. run. Uh, but I'm certain Dan Hurley somewhere has that in the back of his mind, that somebody's up to something somewhere. Let me ask you a very basic question that I know people were asking throughout the night. Once it gets to a point where you're not taking off – from Connecticut at 1.33 a.m. Eastern. You're literally flying through the night. From a body clock perspective, what would be the argument against, hey, guys, stay in your dorms, get a good night's sleep, and we'll go to Arizona tomorrow? Uh, from a body clock perspective, I don't think there's any argument at all. I think Dan Hurley and some other people in the program wanted to be here as quickly as possible. And the fact that it is a cross-country flight, they just wanted to get here on the ground. Also, kind of behind-the-scenes logistics stuff, when you watch the Final Four on Saturday, you're going to see, and when you're, if you're in the building, you're going to see, you know, glamour shots of players, you know, smiling, dribbling a ball, you know, talking to the camera. Those are called specialty shoots. And all of those specialty shoots get done with every single team throughout today. UConn's players will still have their specialty stuff. If, if, if stuff would have forced it at that point, they would have pushed it to tomorrow. But right. they want to get all that stuff done today so that Friday can truly be about, other than media obligations, 
prepping for the game. I just don't know why they didn't leave earlier. Right. Dan wanted to practice in stores yesterday if they had left because they were done Saturday. I saw them in Boston, but they chose to do what they did, and it led to just a bad, just a domino effect where the plane they were going to be on had mechanical issues. Then the flight crew, there's strict regulations about how often these pilots can work, obviously, for safety reasons. And so they are finally here. I don't think it really impacts the game that much, but it is a thing. Like, you and I both know. Uh, travel story. What's your – give me give me one because I – Listeners to this podcast, longtime listeners know that he has had some brutal ones. I think you once slept on a Pittsburgh airport overnight. I th- I have, I've got a million awful travel stories. I should preface everything by saying anytime you land safely, that's, that's a good, I, that's I a good, that's a good <laughs> travel story. Yep. Anytime you land safely, you got a good travel story. But um, underneath that, there's levels to it. I had one, the one you're referencing. I was actually on my way to New York, Memphis to New York, for, I believe, the Big East Tournament. Flying up on a Friday night is my wife and I, and at the time, our very young son. And about an, I don't know, an hour outside of New York City, it gets real bumpy. Ba-bump, 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 like this. We circle Manhattan for like an hour. And it's, we're looking for a window to land. We cannot find it. And it's bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. I don't want to overstate it. I don't know how many people were on the plane. But if you call it 150 people on this plane, 75 were getting sick. And the, the sound of people getting sick will make <laughs> other more. Oh, buddy, it was rough. So we, lay, we had, to, we had yes. to reroute to Pittsburgh and land in Pittsburgh, stay close to the gate because we're waiting for a window in New York City. Don't go anywhere. We're going to jump back on this plane, and as soon as we see the window, we're going back to New York City. Get back on the plane, fly back to New York City, (laughs) bump, 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 circle in Manhattan, people getting sick again. We went back to Pittsburgh and stayed the night. So um, we landed safely eventually, landed safely every time, but there's nothing fun about being on a plane with 75 people and, getting, uh, yeah. getting sick. And by the way, on that note, uh, it was anyone that had to fly on, on Wednesday, it was also super bumpy. I don't know if you had turbulence, mm-hmm. but I had turbulence. Just the, the entire country, uh, in addition to all this, it was really, really, really turbulent there. But they are on the ground now, and uh, again, Dan Hurley's press conference will be later. We'll see what he says. Uh, I did check in with him as he was waiting and waiting and waiting, and he had sent me just thinking positive thoughts in all capital letters. <laughs> so I think he's doing I think he's doing his best. I can't help but wonder if he tried to do some yoga literally in the middle of the aisle as they were flying over the country. I, I will say, and just to put a button on this and then we'll move on, it is a big story. Your reporting on it was fabulous. It should have no impact on what we're talking about Saturday. They're still here, UConn, 50 hours, more than 50 hours before tip-off of their game. They are almost never in a city outside of their own 50 hours before a game. This is um, inconvenient, frustrating, I'm certain, yeah. but not a big deal relative to what we're going to watch on Saturday. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree with that, and also UConn's been so dominant. I just find it uh, ironic, and, <laughs> and while it was not fun, they, UConn could not find a close game. I mean, it was looking everywhere. It could not find anything to resist it, and the one thing that did is the one thing that gets us all airline travel. So this is a a new story connected to this Final Four, but we enter it with tons of stories anyway. There's the Purdue story, trying to go from losing to a 16 seed one year to winning a national championship the next. There's the Alabama story, a football school being coached by a guy who was a high school coach roughly a decade ago. Now they're here at the Final Four. NC State as a double-digit seed. UConn trying to be the first back-to-back winner since Florida in 06-07. What's our favorite storyline now headed into this Final Four. We'll discuss that next. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We are on CBS Sports Network. I am Gary Parrish. I'm sitting here with Matt Norlander, and we're now just two days away from the 2024 Final Four. Obviously, UConn and Purdue are heavy favorites to advance to Monday night. But, Norlander, let me ask you this. Before we get to this Final Four and the games are played, have you settled on a favorite story here? Is it UConn trying to go back-to-back after travel issues? Is it Alabama, this football school, suddenly shooting its way into a Final Four, having an opportunity to win a national championship for the first time in this sport in school history? Obviously, the Purdue story with Matt Painter and Zach Eady is well-documented. NC State has an opportunity to, if they can win two more games, become the lowest-seeded team as an 11th seed to ever win the NCAA tournament. Is one of those your favorite or something else? Uh, no, I 
To me, I think it's Purdue, although uh, if you're watching and you have not listened to our uh, sit-down with Ian Eagle, I talked with Ian Eagle about this in the Tuesday edition of the Ion College Basketball Podcast. He was a stud, and I asked him about this as well. For him, he said it's the everything that's attached to NC State, and there's a really, really, really compelling case for that. But I would lean narrowly Purdue from a what's pulling me in the most for a couple of reasons. It is the fact that it's in the Final Four for the first time since 1980. It's the fact that we have a, the leading scorer in the country. It's not just that Zach Eady is the National Player of the Year. Oh, by the way, he is the CBS Sports National Player of the Year. Spoiler alert, we told you this was going to be a case two weeks ago or two months ago. Um, but you have the best scorer in the country making the Final Four. It's, it's been 64 years since we saw that. It was Oscar Robertson. That, Matt Painter, redemption, a really, and I know you speak to this so well, GP, because we talked about it, I think in the off season, Purdue's fan base, we got, in, we got into joking about, like, all these fan bases, they get online, they get really angry at you, but what are some of the kindest and, and most respectful fan bases? And I was like, what about Purdue? And you were even like, you know what, that's a good point. That fan base deserves this moment. We'll see if it can win Saturday. We'll see if it can get to a national championship game and, and get a national championship. But, I mean, Matt Painter considered one of the best coaches and best guys in the sport someone who deserves this moment so it's a very close race there's a lot of compelling stuff with even alabama which is the kind of the overlooked team but for me it's everything attached to purdue using a traditional big man zach Eady, national player of the year getting that ending that him showing that emotion with evan washburn i would lean that what about you i think it's purdue and now i can draw from any of these yeah. i think they're all awesome like the nato story is incredible it's the guy who was a a high school basketball coach a high school teacher Yes. You know, roughly a decade ago. I believe ago. a math teacher, if I remember correctly. Yes. And now he's two wins away from a national championship at one of the biggest and best football schools of all time. That's great stuff, independent of anything else. The NC State story, phenomenal. DJ Burns, incredible. Having an opportunity to be an 11 seed and win a national championship, obviously never happened before. If it does, that's a massive story, a historically relevant story. UConn trying to go back-to-back. Incredible after losing three of the top six scores from last season's team. Uh, that's an awesome story. But I, I lean slightly with you towards Purdue because of what happened last season, because they are headlined, a coach and star player, by two people who are maybe not right now in this moment, but have spent years being consistently doubted and discounted by people and, dis either, and dismissed it, i would even say it's either matt painter can't win the big one or zach Eady's only good because he's tall or some version of mm -hmm. that stuff so to watch them on monday night be holding a national championship trophy would be an incredible story and i think frankly my favorite story that could emerge from this final four i'll be happy for and proud of whoever emerges but i think the the sweetest story maybe that's the way to put it would be purdue cutting nets on monday yeah I, th I think so as well and that but if if we got to that it would also entail uh if it was against uconn it, 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 if that's on the table uh, we might have one of the better championship games we've ever seen and certainly uh, i've said this before i wrote it uh, in my column from boston last weekend no matter how connecticut ends its ncaa tournament here it's going to be a very noisy, significant event. Either it wins back-to-back -back championships in whatever fashion it does. It blows 16s out again like it did a year ago and has one of the best two-year runs in the history of the sport. Or uh, it, gets, it, gets a, it gets a thriller. And, while, and we would love to see – I would love to see UConn find a close game. But if it's not that – and it gets knocked out, then the team that does it is going. It's, it's going to be a dynamite, a volcanic level kind of event there. Uh, but it is, uh, it is incredible. I, can we, can we get to a point at all where you can either see Bama beating UConn or NC State beating Purdue? Because I don't, GP, I don't put that out of the realm of possibility. Because here's the, here's the biggest reason why. Although I'm not picking against UConn, I refuse to do it. I refuse to pick UConn a close game until I see him do it. But the Final Four stage. The rhythms of what these players do, like it is a different, it's even a different thing from the tournament, from where you stay, wh where you go, all the prep, all the attention, final season. I do think that can sometimes maybe have a tangible effect on a team. So I don't put it out of my mind, but it does feel like we are strutting to a Purdue UConn Monday night. What about you? Well, it does feel like that's where we're headed. Um, from a probabilities perspective, that is where we're headed. Um, both of these teams, UConn and Purdue, are sizable favorites in the national semifinals. But I think it's crazy to ever start ruling things out, mm -hmm. particularly when you get to this stage. Because by definition, if you are here, even if you're an 11 seat, 
you have beaten some good teams to get here. It's almost impossible to get here without beating somebody quality, multiple teams quality along the way. So do I think UConn is going to handle Alabama? Yes, they handle everybody. Do I think Purdue is going to handle NC State? Yes. I think on paper, based on four months of basketball, yeah. maybe not two weeks, but four months of basketball, um, one team is clearly better than the other. But I also thought Kentucky was going to get past Oakland. I also thought UNLV was going to get past Duke once upon a time. I think I think you thought Texas Tech was going to get past NC State because I thought that too. I also believe Texas Tech would get past NC State. More famously in 2015, I thought undefeated Kentucky would get past Wisconsin in the national semifinals. We're always wrong about this stuff. Everybody is always wrong about this stuff. The fact that it is so difficult to predict and project is what makes it amazing. So we got plenty of time between now and Saturday. I'll go ahead and spoil it for you. I'm going to pick UConn to win, and I'm also going to pick Purdue to win. But anybody out there talking like or thinking like there's just no way we get anything other than UConn and Purdue on Monday night, that's just ignorant to the history of this event and this sport. We are surprised constantly, and we might be again. Yeah, I remember sitting courtside, 2015 National Semis, undefeated Kentucky team going against Wisconsin. And the talk going, even before going into that weekend, the weeks before when Kentucky hadn't lost the game was like, what's the one team that actually might have the style and the roster to take out Kentucky? And Wisconsin was identified, um, but no one really saw it. I'll never forget Frank Kaminsky when the game hit triple zeros in Wisconsin in the Kentucky season. He screamed toward the Wisconsin section, make them believe, make them believe. And I'll never forget that scene because Wisconsin was a very, very good team. It was a better team that season than obviously NC State is this season, uh, and even Alabama is. But on this big stage, anything is possible. Bama, can, it might need to get 100, but it can score. We know it can score 100, and we know that NC State can have its defense turn it up. Six straight opponents under 40%. We've got plenty of time to continue previewing these matchups, and we will. We've got a whole Friday show for you as well. But uh, I'm with you in, in that it feels like UConn versus Purdue. And then obviously if we got that, it is quite clearly the most enticing matchup for a number of reasons, maybe the biggest among them, pun intended, would be Klingon versus Edie. When we come back, we'll turn our attention to Zach Edie. He is now a two-time CBS Sports National Player of the Year. He will soon be a two-time Wooden Award winner, the first we've seen since Ralph Sanson. Norlander did a big profile on the Purdue star last year. Everybody knows he's tall. Everybody knows he's good. How did Zach Edie become college basketball's best player? We'll discuss that next. I on College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Eye on College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. I'm Gary Parrish. This is Matt Norlander and Zach Eady. Earlier today became a two-time CBS Sports National Player of the Year. He will soon become a two-time Wooden Award winner, the first since Ralph Sampson in the early 80s. Everybody knows he's great at this point. I think everybody knows the basics at this point. But before Zach Eady was a National Player of the Year, you wrote a big profile on him to sort of tell his story. How did this seven foot four Canadian become the best college basketball player in the country two straight years? Yeah, um, man, he's gone through so much since I wrote this profile. I flew out to West Lafayette GP last year, uh, January of 23, and just before it was ultra well known that, you know, he rejected basketball, he liked playing hockey, he liked playing baseball, which have become cliche talking points on it. Uh, I kind of dug into the why of Zach Eady and how he was able to do this. Uh, he was specific. He had a stubbornness about him. He he rejected it because he didn't want to play basketball because everyone assumed that he would want to. And then it got to a certain point where he had a genuine love for the game. But he didn't play organized basketball at a high level until, you know, his his closing years of, of high school. It's kind of wild. And uh, because he was so tall, he eventually got to be recruited by the likes of Baylor, Purdue, Western Kentucky, one or two other schools. But Purdue has been the big man factory. Painter has specialized in that. And he quietly paid his dues i mean he he got to he got to purdue was not an immediate impact player uh but i remember talking with steve lutz who just a few days ago got hired at oklahoma state recru was the lead recruiter for zach Eady at purdue and um i remember him telling me this would have been i guess midway through his sophomore year maybe going into sophomore year He's like, Edie will be the guy. Like he, I remember talking to him because we do our top 101 preseason players list, and I always try and hit up a, a bunch of different coaches. 
And he was basically saying, like, you're going to want to rank Edie high. And I was like, high? He's like, he's going to be a monster. Because for people who don't know, the year before Zach Edie became the National Player of the Year, he was a part-time player splitting time in Purdue's front court with Trevion Williams. Correct, correct. And so it was, it was the fact that Matt Painter didn't play both. Uh, I think I remember writing about it or tweeting about it. They didn't play at the same time. They, they just there was not like, get literally, the there was like two plays the entire right. season that he actually, the Painter was like, all right, because of this specific design, we're going to have two. But they didn't do it. And so he, he waited his turn. And what, what's always been true about Zach Eady is he's a quick study. He's patient. And he has a discipline about him that is relentless, and it has paid off. Um, I actually think he's more athletic than he's given credit for. I think he's got a ton of grace for a seven foot four person. I mean, listen, you and I, you and I both, you and I both, since we've seen each other here on this set, have had less than graceful moments, and <laughs> we're nowhere near seven four. Uh, but Edie has great touch, great passing, and he has turned into a behemoth. And I think one of the most important things is Edie gets most of the credit. But and Painter, how he has used him has been incredible because there's there's not a lot of seven four dudes that are as good as Edie, but we see seven one, seven two, seven three guys, and they're just not as productive. They just are not. It's been uh, it's been amazing, and his relationship in particular with his mom Julia, who's been a champion. You'll see her on. She'll be caught on television cameras again on Saturday. Um, just has uh, has been amazing. She's lived in West Lafayette uh, in the same town as him, and he is he's an awesome story. A really really great dude. Soft spoken. There's no assumptions about him whatsoever, and he's at at once a throwback in terms of his style, but also just kind of who he is. I, he dominates in 2024. He would have dominated in 2004, 94, and 1964. The only difference between 2024 and, say, 1964 or 1984, well, there's a lot of differences. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the only difference? We don't really have the time for that today. A lot of differences, but among them would be in 1984 or 1994, he would be the number one pick in the draft. Yeah. Where would he go now, and would you feel comfortable using a lottery pick on him? See, that this is an interesting question because you get, you get some disagreement among evaluators when it comes to this. Uh, I, I just can't – me personally, I, I, I don't see why there's not room for Zach Eady. You see GP's mock draft here as a top 20 pick. I mean, I can't speak to for sure if he should or will go top, fifth, top 14 as lottery – but I have watched him, and I understand, like, he's not a great defender in space 18 feet away from the hoop. But uh, you are hearing more and more people that are high, high major college coaches, high profile coaches, NBA people saying, no, there, there, there is room for a big man still in the NBA. It's not, the game's not what it was. It's, it's never going to go back to what it was. But if you're seven four, super skilled, great at drawing contact, not getting into foul trouble, you're telling me that a franchise can't find use for Zach Eady for even 10 minutes a game? And, and because of his size and his touch that he won't have a 10-year NBA career, I reject that. And I'll say this, GP, and if you're watching the show, you see this outrageous uh, stat that Zach Eady has had 30 and 15 going to a Final Four along the likes of Elvin Hayes, Jerry Lucas, Jerry West, Bill McGillan, Chamberlain. Just, it's an insane statistic right there. Um, it is refreshing to hear that we are not abandoning what we're seeing in front of our eyes. I think even Dan Hurley would tell you it as well. We are just not abandoning the idea that he's an awesome, incredible player who's super efficient in addition to having all this great volume. He should be a top-20 pick. I thought Dan Hurley made a great point earlier this week in an interview somewhere where he was asked about Zach Eady, and he said, I just think that if you're in the NBA and you can't figure out a way to use this guy, like maybe you're not thinking enough. Yeah. Maybe you're not playing basketball the right way. And I feel like we've got into – and I love the NBA. I don't never try to pit the two sports mm -hmm. against each other. But I think we have gotten to a point in the NBA where sometimes people just make broad decisions about you. Like you can work and you can't work without saying this person is uniquely gifted and doing unprecedented things at the collegiate level. Let's sit down and figure it out. Like, let's get him here and let's figure out. Instead of focusing on what we think he can't do, which is guard in space and guard smaller players, let's try to really figure out what he can do and figure out how we can alleviate the other stuff. These are not similar players in any way whatsoever, but the biggest reason Steph Curry went deeper in the draft than he obviously should have gone is because folks got so focused on what they thought he couldn't do as opposed to just looking at what's right in front of them. And I think if you do that with Zach Eady, you will see something that can be useful at the NBA level. I'm not betting my mortgage on it. I hear but, you. But I like the idea from Dan Hurley 
this guy is something special. Figure it out. And I'll curl it back to the college angle here because the pro stuff is, is very intriguing. And the next two games, if they play two games, obviously we'll add to his, his NBA file there. But there's been, like, semi-consistent talk about how the men's game, and we're going to talk some women's college hoops before we get out of the show as well, has lacked star power. And I'm not saying that it has had a Zion Williamson-level star. I'm not saying that. But we have a two-time, as you said, Wooden Naismith Award, CBS Sports Player of the Year. And Zach Eady is an attraction. Because he doesn't have a huge personality, I get that. Um, but in this very Final Four between Eady DJ Burns practically overnight, and Klingon, who is not even the most important player on UConn's roster, um, I just I, I reject that, and I think it's actually been a disservice to Edie because you can't tell me he's not interesting. He's seven four and can go for thirty four and nineteen on a given night. To me, that's you can't tell me that's not interesting and that's not star power. Two time national player of the year. We haven't seen it in four decades. And he has shown some personality yes. in post game interviews yes. with the great Evan Washburn. Give us some more, Zach. And in other places, and I think all of that is starting to grow. Maybe if you wanted to say two months ago that college basketball doesn't have an identifiable, recognizable star, I'd listen to you. But if Zach Eady were walking down basically any street in America right now, people would know who I, he is. That's a bang on. Uh, yes, not even just here at the Final Four, but the, by the nature of the tournament, Purdue being a top three team most of the season and Edie being 7-4, he is identifiable. He is a huge star. And, oh, by the way, no matter what happens here, GP, he is an all-time legend because of his two-time National Player of the Year uh, accolades and everything he's done to get Purdue to a Final Four. Uh, legendary status. You cannot take that from him. When we come back, we will turn our attention to the women's Final Four because I guess people can debate if they want to whether the men's side's got star power. No question. We got tons of star power on the women's side. That doubleheader on Friday should be outstanding. We'll talk women's Final Four next. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. And before we get the men's Final Four on Saturday, we will get the women's Final Four on Friday, and it's terrific. South Carolina, NC State, Iowa, UConn, Caitlin Clark, Paige Beckers, Dawn Staley, Gino Ariama. <laughs> And this comes after a record-setting Elite Eight game between Iowa and LSU, where the average audience was 12.3 million. Famously, at this point, it has outdrawn Purdue, Tennessee, on the men's side in the Elite Eight. Yeah. The final round of last year's Masters. Every game in last year's World Series. Most of the games in last year's NBA Finals. What do you make it? this historically important place we're at right now with women's college basketball. I think it's incredible. In fact, um, I think everyone that is enjoying this women's season, this women's NCAA tournament, uh, needs to be uh, better about uplifting the sport of college basketball. We can champion women's college basketball without saying, man, the women's game is so awesome. I'm not even paying attention to the men's NCAA right. tournament. Or, or the backlash to that, which is more trying to put down the women. No, 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 no. We're not doing any of this, okay? Both of these sports are bettered by when we give them the attention and acclaim they deserve. And this is awesome. You see the che cheapest ticket price? I've even seen this, though. Yes, of course the cheapest ticket for a women's Final Four is going to be more expensive than the men because the men's venue holds more than three times as many people. Like, that goes without saying. Let's just champion that without having to contrast it with how much it, gets to it costs to get into the men's Final Four this Saturday. It's awesome. Amazing star power. Caitlin Clark is a seminal sports figure, a transformative sports figure, but it is not just Caitlin Clark. You have Paige Beckers, who was Caitlin Clark before Caitlin Clark in some respects. Gino Oriemo, who has a case as the greatest coach in the history of college basketball and then Don Staley who is just uh, guiding an undefeated team uh, and is on the brink of history it's it's phenomenal and though on the podcast obviously in our jobs as they've been for a long long time we are tasked with reporting on opining on discussing everything tied to the men's game uh, doesn't mean that we don't appreciate and can't give love and respect to what has been just such an awesome, awesome thing to see. I think this is the rise of women's college basketball this season. And it really did start with last year's women's NCAA tournament. It started there and, and the run with, with Angel Reese versus Caitlin Clark. And it's just continued to catapult. I think it's, it's I don't know, decades overdue. But I'm glad we're here. And, and I, I truly believe 
you and I might be talking on this pod three, five years from now, and we'll still be finding reasons to discuss women's college basketball, and it's not going to rise and fade with the career of Caitlin Clark at Iowa. To your point about this really starting last year, I think you can actually pinpoint kind of where it starts. It starts with Angel Reese taunting Caitlin Clark yeah. in the national championship game, at which point both of those women are superstars. And for us to then find ourselves roughly a year later in the Elite Eight and they're matched up again. And I think all of it matters. What happened Monday night with those television, perfect storm of everything. Mm -hmm. It was a rematch of the national title game. It was Caitlin, Caitlin Clark, the sports all-time leading scorer. It was Angel Reese on the other side. It was Kim Mulkey on the sideline yeah. after the Washington Post article that had been getting a lot of attention leading up to it and the controversial L.A. Times column yeah. that Kim Mulkey brought attention to and the L.A. Times ultimately apologized for. So you had all this stuff, and then the game started, and the game was obviously fabulous, and that's how you get the big number. But you're exactly right. The context matters, but we don't have to make it into something it's not. You know what it is? It is that women's basketball at the collegiate level is bigger than it's ever been for a lot of different reasons, mostly Caitlin Clark as it pertains to what we're talking about right now. But it's not bigger than men's basketball. It, it did it'll draw Monday night's Elite Eight game. more people than uh, it, it, it drew more people than Purdue, Tennessee on the men's side. Yeah. But it didn't draw more people than Duke, NC State right. on the men's side. And you get into these conversations. I heard this one over the past week. Again, just frustration rooted in people constantly trying to make it out to be something more than it is or something that it doesn't need to be. You've heard this. I mean, it's stupid, but you've heard it. Caitlin Clark doesn't need to go to the Big Three or even the WNBA. She should go to the NBA. Like, people who get paid to hold microphones just like this have said that in the microphones over the past week. That's obviously absurd. And when you say things like that, mm -hmm. and I know it's meant as a compliment. Right. It's designed to be, Caitlin Clark's amazing. She should go to the NBA. But all that does, when you try to make this out to be something it's not, it just invites other people to point out all of the obvious reasons she shouldn't and couldn't go to the NBA. At which point, now you're in a conversation that shouldn't even be happening. So I wish people would just focus on what this is. And what this is, is a Friday night doubleheader that should deliver historically great numbers and a Final Four that could go down in history as one of the greatest we've ever seen on the women's side. Without a doubt. And I, were, for, you know, my experiences in the past decade or so covering the Final Four on the men's side and that Friday night after you finish your media responsibilities, you know, the games for the men's side don't tip off until, depending on what uh, part of the country you're in, sometimes not until the evening or late afternoon, right? And so it allows people to really stretch out, have a good time, okay. right? But what happens is inevitably uh, I find myself with many other sports writers but, but casual fans who are here for the men's Final Four glued to the TV watching the women's Final This is not a new thing. Like this, particularly maybe it's because I'm at these Final Four sites. Uh, people get very, very wrapped up, and there have been some tremendous games over the years in the women's semifinals. I hope we get it again. We have incredible, incredible storylines. Um, I think it's an amazing thing for college basketball that on the men's side and the women's side, we have almost a dozen different angles and storylines with different coaches, players, programs, teams. It's amazing. And to what we said in the previous segment, it's, it holds true here. We don't need to try and put a one-upsmanship with the NBA and men's college basketball constantly like, oh, this sport's better. No, this sport's better. They're, they're if they're played by, uh, with a ball, you got to put into a hoop. I get it, but they are different, different sports. Same thing with the men and women, championing the one for the other and just having the sport in a very, very healthy place. The TV uh, ratings reflect that. Duke NC State and, and Iowa versus LSU, they were they rated higher than all but five college football games last season, and I'm including national semifinals in the CFP title game, which was three of the five. Oh, Ohio State, Michigan was one of them. So it speaks to when we get to this time of the year, just how much of a truly national event these, these tournaments are. And one last thing that I think is important to note in the context of this conversation, there was a time not too long ago when college administrators would go to Congress and argue that you can't have NIL and you oh. can't have anything other than amateurism because people would stop watching. Right. Because the entire heart of the industry was the concept of amateurism. And they went to Congress and they said, if you allow student athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness, then we lose what we have. People won't care anymore. We have historic numbers in the NCAA men's basketball tournament, historic numbers in the NCAA women's basketball yeah. tournament, historic numbers in college football. Angel Reese is wealthy. Yeah. Caitlin Clark is wealthy. DJ Burns has made six figures in the past two weeks off of NIL. You're telling me that's not a great story? Come on. 
Nobody cares. It's just like what they used to say at the Olympics. If you ever let the next Mary Lou Retton be a millionaire. <laughs> Mary Lou Retton drop on the pod, by the way. First one ever. First one ever. Childhood idol. I have a Mary Lou Retton autograph. I'll show it to you sometime. If we ever let the next Mary Lou Retton become a millionaire, we're going to have real problems. People won't care about the Olympics anymore. Well, Michael Phelps swims. He makes a lot of money. Everybody watches. Nobody cares. Same thing with college athletics. Some of these student athletes we're now watching are making a lot of money, and we're all still watching and enjoying it the same way we always have. When we come back, one more segment to go. NIT, final tonight, and there's two teams that a lot of people thought should be in the NCAA tournament. Does anything that happened with Seton Hall or Indiana State in this NIT mean that, yeah, they actually had a real gripe on Selection Sunday? I'll ask Norlander that next. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the I Own College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. I'm Gary Parrish. This is Matt Norlander. We're on site here in Phoenix for the men's 2024 Final Four, two days away from the national semifinals. But tonight we get a national final in the NIT between Indiana State and Seton Hall. And it's interesting because these are two teams that thought they deserved to be in the NCAA tournament on Selection Sunday. Mm -hmm. They are two teams that, frankly, a lot of people thought deserved to be in the NCAA tournament on Selection Sunday. Does Indiana State, Seton Hall, advancing this deep into the NIT bracket, prove that they had a case on Selection Sunday? Or, hey, we had that conversation then. Uh, Nothing that happens after that matters. How about the fact that it's these two teams, GP? Mm-hmm. How about the fact that it's these two teams that were so close that would have been in the tournament had we not had so many bid thieves? There is a case. I think two things can be true here at once. There is a case that Indiana State and Seton Hall deserve to be in, should be in, and this is evidence of how the committee messed up. But I, I, I refuse to stray too far from my idea that it's what you did on Selection Sunday and all the stuff that takes place thereafter for the most part, you can't use it to refute or, or you know, and reinforce an argument because you can play that game forever. Uh, what's undeniable to me is this, is that they, are, they, they look like it and they were playing like it. I believe that going into Selection Sunday, I believe that they were playing like two teams that were easily deserving of getting into the field, and yet here we are. I don't like to have revisionist history, and I posted a bracket, or at least a 68-team field, mm-hmm about an hour before the bracket was unveiled on CBS, and I did not have Indiana State in, and I did not have Seton Hall in. I understood why others did, but the bubble shrinking really caused problems for bracketologists and the Seton Halls and Indiana States and Pitts of the world because it eliminated, I don't want to say any real chance of them getting in, but it obviously um, contributed to to them being left out. And so this is awesome that they have um, gone from that moment of disappointment to uh, bring something positive out of their seasons. And, you know, I, I can't wait to turn it on a little later on in the afternoon here in Phoenix as opposed to night on the East Coast. But I don't think it changes anything on Selection Sunday. I still think Indiana State, based on the resume it had put together, probably based on the number of spots we had left, yep. deserved to be left out. And I would say the same thing on that day, respectfully, about Seton Hall. Yeah. Now, before we get out of here, let's turn our attention okay. to the coaching news of the day. Yeah. I see you over there playing on I'm, your I'm Guster literally computer. Doing, I'm, doing, I'm doing multiple things at once here. Obviously, the big news out there is that Eric Musselman is uh, in discussions yes. to become the next head coach at USC yes. and leave Arkansas. Uh, what's the latest on that situation? Right, so this is real-time information, when we're, which, by the way, no one cares, but there's a there's a crazy streak where I've been on HQ with a high major hiring, like six of the past nine of these things. So here it happens again here on CBS Sports Network. Um, uh, sources are indicating to me that barring uh, a last-minute change of heart, which is just frankly doesn't look like it's on the table, uh, USC is set to hire Eric Musselman. They are in the closing stages of this. A deal has not been signed. Eric Musselman has been at Arkansas for the past five years. He has been involved in this search going back more than a week. He has been a high-priority target. I was told by a source less than 10 minutes ago that AD Jen Cohen, uh, frankly, was so taken with Eric Musselman and people around the USC program that unless there is something at the very last minute
president that steps in to change this. Eric Musselman will be the next coach at USC, which would mean if we, in fact, get there, and that looks like where we are headed right now, uh, uh, the final high major job would fill, and then another high major job would open because then you get Arkansas, which is a better job than USC. It is not debatable. Uh, but the two factors here in play for Musselman was location, huge, went to San Diego, you know, Los Angeles. He's got plenty of ties to, to Southern California. And then, frankly, Arkansas is coming off a very disappointing season. Um, it's so much less pressure there. And if you're trying to – USC, you're like, what, the ninth most important team entity at best in that city. You're trying to get an injection. Uh, Musselman certainly brings that. I think location is something that – fans often completely overlook and it's so important to coaches and so important to their families um it it's a story about nothing but coincidentally like i was with muss the weekend that he met his wife <laughs> we were in los angeles um obviously living in los angeles is a different place than living in fayetteville arkansas it's a college town against um, a, a major metropolitan one of the greatest and big cities that we have in this country. And so I've actually had coaches call me before when they are, um, you know, a candidate for a certain job. I had a coach call me one time who was a candidate at Mississippi State. And he didn't call me because he wanted to know, you know, what I knew about Mississippi State basketball or what I knew about the athletic director. He wanted to know because I, I live in Mississippi. I was uh, raised in Mississippi. And he wanted to know about living in Starkville, Mississippi and raising a family in Starkville, Mississippi. It was very important to yeah. him. If I'm about to relocate my wife and kids, um, where am I relocating them to? And based on, uh, I hope, that you, after our conversation, I can just tell you, he turned down Mississippi State. Yes. I don't think I made him turn down Mississippi State, but he did. But that type of thing is a, it's a real thing that matters to families. And, and I'm unsurprised that Muss and Danielle, his wife, would prefer to live in L.A. than, than say, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a major one. Um, I mean, I'm going to send, I'm, gonna, I'm literally just going to send the tweet, right? No. So it's out there. Um, it would take a. It would take something at the eleventh hour to change this. Uh, there was a second candidate. Won't reveal it here. Who was involved late into Wednesday night and, and early Thursday morning, but USC is pivoting in a different direction. And uh, if indeed this becomes material soon here, that's uh, it's huge. When Arkansas, if if and when Arkansas opens, then it comes the question of who would be up for that job. Oh my goodness, GP. <laughs> I mean, you would think. Uh, I'm just vamping off the top of my head. Buzz Williams. You may hear Will Wade's name tossed out there. I wonder Chris Jans. Um, there's a number of different candidates, but that's a whole other cycle. And Hunter Yurchek, the athletic director at Arkansas, if he winds up having to deal with this in real time here, no question about it, he'll be prepared. He actually was on the record talking earlier this week about the fact that Musselman was involved in this, and it's been an interesting search. It, it feels like Arkansas has known for at least several weeks and maybe longer that it might, emphasis on the word might, but that it might, need to be looking for a new basketball coach at some point because there was reporting, and I'm sure you talked to sources just like I, that must, um, you know, if he couldn't get the USC job, there were other jobs that have already filled that he would have had interest in as well. So it appears now he will leave Fayetteville for USC. And one of, you would agree with this, one of the best jobs in the SEC, about 20 seconds, um, is about to be open. Yeah, without a doubt. Arkansas unquestionably ranks among the top three or four jobs in the SEC. Of course, we're getting an SEC that is expanding to 16 teams with Texas and Oklahoma coming in. So we wait for the next stage here, GP. But it always seems like the Final Four every year brings at least one of these major coaching story headlines away from the actual games, and this is that one. This is definitely that one. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Teagle. He's a legend. Shouts to Huck and Larnell. And thank you guys once again for watching the Ion College Basketball on CBS Sports Network. We'll be right back here live from the stadium tomorrow in Glendale. We'll talk to you then.